Hi, this is Andrea Kane, and I'm here with you for HIT 292 Reimbursement Systems. And we are still on Chapter 7 because this is Week 12. And this is video number 6 of 7 for you. This is about safety net providers. And if you're following along in your book, it's page 181. So let's get into it. When we talk about safety net providers, what we're really referring to here are federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics. Some key terms you need to know are all-inclusive rate, federally qualified health center, revenue code, rural health clinic, rural area, safety net provider, sliding scale, and urban area. Safety net providers Organize and deliver a significant level of health care and other related services. They are essential community providers. They are providers of last resort, and they are core safety net providers. They have two characteristics. The first characteristic is by legal mandate or explicitly adopted mission. They maintain an open door, offering services to patients regardless of their ability to pay. Their second characteristic is a substantial share of their patient mix is uninsured, Medicaid, or other vulnerable patients. So the majority of these patients have limited access to health care services, are of low income, and or members of medically underserved areas or populations. What is a medically underserved area or population? Well, they've been defined by the Health Resources and Services Administration as whole counties or groups of contiguous counties or groups of urban census tracts. They ha have groups of, of people who are facing economic, cultural, or linguistic barriers to health care. Often migratory and seasonal agricultural workers are included in this the homeless, and residents of public housing. This is a map, and again, this is from 2018, but the map is from 2015, so we're looking at five-year-old data here. But this shows you medically underserved areas in green across the United States. And you can see there are some in Iowa, and even in Northeast Iowa, there are hand, a handful there. In these medically underserved areas or medically underserved populations, health professional shortages um, abound. These residents have shortages of personal health services. There's high infant mortality, high poverty, and or high elderly population. So that's what makes these areas in such need of health care providers and health care clinics and services. All right, now let's look at federally qualified health centers versus rural health clinics. Federally qualified health centers are nonprofit, patient governed, community directed. They're located in urban and rural areas. They increase access to comprehensive basic health services. Rural health clinics can be public or private, not for profit or for profit. They can be provider based or independent. They must be located in rural areas. They can't be in an urban area. Federally designated health professional shortage area, they have to be in a federally designated health professional shortage area or governor designated health care professional shortage area. And they must increase access to primary health care services in rural areas. So note those differences. You need to know what an FQHC is, what an RHC is, and how they are similar, how are they different. Make sure you are very up on that. FQHCs, it's the largest primary care network in the United States. Did you know that? Federally qualified health centers are the largest primary care network in the U.S. They serve over 21 million patients and have 9,000 sites. At least they did in 2015, which is when the map is showing us. RHCs, there's about 4,100 of those, probably more since 2014, which is what they're showing us here. And they were established under the Rural Health Clinic Services Act in 1977. 
And there's quite a few. You can see in Northeast Iowa, there are quite a few rural health clinics. There weren't that many FQHCs in Northeast Iowa, but RHCs abound. So let's again look at the similarities and differences between FQHCs and RHCs. FQHC is outpatient primary care with lab services and services directly or through arrangement for things such as dental, behavioral health, substance use, abuse or use, services, and transportation. RHCs are also outpatient primary care, but they only provide basic lab services and they are not required to have services directly or through arrangement. They both provide physician services. They often utilize nurse practitioners, physician assistants, certified nurse midwives, clinical psychologists, and clinical social workers in their settings. They do have visiting nurse services to the homebound where CMS has determined a shortage of, health, uh, of home health agencies is. Medicare Part B covers drugs furnished by an incident to services of F FQHCs or RHC providers. So who are the key payers? Well, with FQHC, you have 41% Medicaid, 8% Medicare, and 51% other payer. With RHCs, you have 25% Medicaid, 31% Medicare, and 44% other payer. So there is a difference in their payer mix. When we look at FQHC PPS, it's a per diem reimbursement methodology with a geographic adjustment factor utilized. The unit of payment is a single face-to-face -face patient encounter. It is risk adjusted for new patients, initial preventative physical exams, and annual wellness visits. Some exceptions to that single encounter per diem rule is multiple health or mental health encounters on the same day. Lab and tech components of ancillary services built separately to Medicare Part B. And flu and pneumonia vaccines are reimbursed at cost. RHC has an all-inclusive rate. They do use K case rate methodology per qualifying face-to-face -face encounter. The reimbursement rate is constant and does not change by type of service or intensity. The reimbursement rate is RHC specific based on reasonable cost from the clinic's cost report. Notice that there was no mention of a cost report with the other one. Subject to annual reconciliation and the national maximum payment per visit is set each year. Again, federal register. And that is it for safety net providers. I will be back with your last video for chapter seven and that will be on hospice, so stay tuned.